Welcome back to Preterist Apologetics right here this evening. <laughs> <laughs> Don and I are both very tired. <laughs> we, we are both extremely, <laughs> extremely tired. I, I tell you, I have been working on my preparation for the upcoming debate with Richard Carrier. I mean, early to late, you know, I just, uh, I don't, yeah, you get a glimpse of my desk back here and that's just a fraction. I mean, I've just got books scattered everywhere. Um, uh, you know, trying to get my opening presentation down, uh, locked down within the 20 minute period, et cetera, et cetera. And so, uh, yeah, I just, and on top of everything else. So hey, Don, <laughs> what is, what is the proposition of the debate? Was Jesus a liar or a failure? What was it? Insofar as the gospels accurately record the words of Jesus, his predictions of the end failed. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. Okay which I think involves him in a severe self-contradiction. But right. I won't go into that right now. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, I don't want to spill the beans. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But uh, nonetheless, like I said, I, I've, I've been watching his videos, his presentations, some of his debates and um, what have you. And I certainly mean no disrespect to him, but I, I see so many of his arguments just full of logical holes that you could drive a Mack truck through. Mm -hmm. I, I just, I, I've been amazed at, at the fallacies that I think that I see in so many of his arguments. And uh, I've just sat shaking my head going, what, mm -hmm. you know, what is it? Could someone call him out on this or that or the other. And uh, he's obviously a very brilliant guy. No question about that. He doesn't, uh, doesn't, you don't achieve the, uh, standing if you please uh prominence uh, without being very very sharp very brilliant i saw him in a q a just the other night i don't know when the q a was held but you have to be impressed with with his mental abilities uh and with his recall of of history and what have you you don't you don't have to be overly impressed with the logic that he tries to imply is factual and overwhelming and what have you when i'm sitting there going that just doesn't follow at all i'm sorry that just doesn't work right. so uh I, I pointed out to someone one of my friends and i were talking about this just the other night and they said well how do you feel about it and i said well you know it's always daunting to to contemplate going up against a quote world-class scholar and that's certainly what he what he is but i said at the same time uh richard carrier is a historian. He's not a theologian. Right. He, is, he is not an exegete. And in our private correspondence that has come through glaringly so, mm. he is not an exegete. He is not a theologian. And so we're coming from two different poles uh, in a manner of speaking. And the good thing about it is we're not debating history. You know, I wouldn't want to try to debate him on pure history, ancient history. But when it comes to what the Bible says and what it predicted, and I think I've already shared this with you, Mike, uh, in our opening conversations, opening emails, he admitted that he takes the position that Jesus, in his predictions of the end, believed that it would happen at the fall of Jerusalem in AD 70. Okay. That, right. only, that only leaves him one avenue to determine and to establish his perspective. And that is, he's got to prove that Jesus predicted the end of time. Right. He, predi he predicted that he was going to come back as a, as I like to say, a five foot five Jewish man in a physical body at the end of time. He right. can't do that. Right. He just can't do that. Uh, and that is proven not from history. That's proven by theology. Right. And exegesis. Right. So I, I was telling my friend, I said, since he is not a theologian, 
that that swings into my wheelhouse. Right. And so it, it's going to be interesting. I, I am a little bit concerned to be real honest about it, <laughs> that he's not going to want to get into theology. He's going to want to get into history. And well, the gospels certainly were not written by eyewitnesses. Acts is a, is a pious fraud. Second Peter three is obviously fraudulent. But that's Acts, baked into the proposition, though, as far as the New Testament is accurate. So, yeah. so he's he's. I mean, that's that's violating the rules. I, absolutely. Well, when you start saying, "Well, Second Peter three is not biblical," well, yes, it is. It's in the text. It is in the text as we have it, and that's right. what I have emphasized with him. This debate is not about. Uh, for instance, textual criticism. It's not about, does this passage belong? Does that book belong? Whatever. It's not what this debate is about. This debate is about what does the Bible as we have it say? Yeah. I was trying to work out a proposition with Robert Price. He's he's another one of these guys. Absolutely. Um, uh, but we just don't have any common ground. You know, it's <laughs> everything's a myth. Everything's um, yeah, Randall Price, or Robert Price and, and his view that the book of Acts is all about uh, a reworking of the story of Odysseus and the story of the Trojan War. And I'm going, what? Yeah, yeah, you can't follow any. <laughs> yeah, but he's a, he's a brilliant, quote, scholar, unquote. But sometimes it has the appearance of being that some scholars in order to get their name out there they they compete with one another who could to see who could come up with the most lavish theories whether yeah. or not there's and you know some of these so-called parallels you just sit back and you go I i'm sorry i just don't see that parallel there <laughs> right right and, uh, and that's what uh, that's what carrier does as well he tries to draw parallels uh, but between osiris the Egyptian God and Jesus. Well, that doesn't work at all. Uh, he, he tries to draw direct parallels between Romulus, you know, one of the supposed co-founders of Rome and Jesus. It doesn't work. There, there are just so many incredibly disparate uh, actions and ideologies and facts between the two, yeah. uh, I mean, they can't even prove, they don't even know if Romulus existed for crying out loud. And, and a good Jew isn't going to be going to, to pagan sources. A good Jew's going to be in the Torah and building his case. You know, I don't even see Saul or, or Paul before, you know, he became an apostle. I don't see him like studying mythology <laughs> and trying to, to get the Old Testament to correspond to the Roman empire's view of the son of God or so. I mean, it's just like, it, it makes no sense historically or theologically for them to be doing that. Like maybe some of the Gnostics or something did that, but I mean, not your mainstream. Oh, your, your mainstream Pharisee. quote, faithful Jews would never, like you're saying, they would never ever have, have appealed to the pagans for a source of any of their doctrine. And this gets back to Richard Carrier. He believes that, a great deal of the Old Testament, but assuredly the New Testament is based upon Zoroastrian, Zoroastrianism. Uh, and he says that that's where they got their doctrine. And you're going, wow. <laughs> and I've been reading scholarly articles on that. And you find scholars who talk about the fact, you know, number one, they can't even prove definitively, definitively that Zoroaster uh, ever actually lived lived you know and and there's so there's so many disparities there's right. so many there's so many places where okay i'm going to draw some parallels okay hey look i've got i've got a parallel here i've got a parallel here and they ignore the fact that i've got 20 points of disparity over here right right <laughs> that, are, that are huge <laughs> that are huge right. so but but again that that gets into the world of scholarship that some men want to come up with something unique and they're skeptics. You, this is the bottom line. So many of these men are skeptics. They hate the story of Jesus. They hate the story of redemption. Yeah. They hate everything about the story. Therefore, if they can deny that Jesus exists as Richard Carrier does, 
and Robert Cross as well. Now he 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 claims Jesus never existed. Correct. Okay, so so Bart Ehrman would chew him out. Oh, yeah, but it's interesting. No. Yeah, I know. It, it's really interesting to listen to him uh, interact with Bart ostensibly to destroy Bart Ehrman. Yeah, but uh, Bart Ehrman takes the day on that issue. Yeah, uh, but I, I seen Bart Ehrman interact with Robert Price. And I actually sent because I heard Robert Price debate James White. Hmm. And of course, it came up, you know, Jesus was a failure. So I sent him House Divided. Yeah, he read it like within a couple of weeks, wrote a, a quick review on it. And he said, you know, he didn't he didn't really want to debate me, but he said, thanks for the book. And he basically said, well, you're just over spiritualizing something <laughs> because because it was a failure. So you're over spiritualizing. Yeah. And I said, no. I said, Jesus was exegeting the kingdom of Daniel too. He was appealing to scripture. He wasn't appealing to myths. He wasn't appealing to anything. This is the scripture and he's unfolding and fulfilling that spiritual kingdom, that and apocalyptic language. And I said, we can still debate. I said, if that's your position, <laughs> you, feel, yeah. you feel that I'm, I'm over spiritualizing, let's debate that. And yeah. you know, he's the he's very first time I ever heard, heard Robert Price expound on his theory uh, about the Trojan War and the whole uh, Odysseus and all of that kind of stuff. I sat there and I thought, huh, I wonder why, <clears throat> wonder why it is in the book of Acts we have one quotation from the Tanakh after another, just one right. after another, and we don't have a single quote from the Odyssey. Yeah, no, not one. And yet it's supposed to be about taking from the Odyssey. Right. Uh, that's a problem, it seems to me. Uh, you, you've got a completely discount, completely discount. Didn't, didn't Paul say, I preach and teach no other things except that which can be found in, in myths? <laughs> <laughs> of course. You know, hey, I missed that until right now. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm pretty sure that was Axe's outline. It was right there. Then, in in chapter know, 24 and in chapter 26, you missed it, Don. And, and Acts chapter 28 as well. I'm sorry I missed that. Boy, oh boy, I'll tell you. <laughs> but, you know, countering that has been our study here in Deuteronomy 32. Oh, absolutely. You've watched the beautiful, perfect harmony as, as Isaiah builds upon Moses' eschatology, as Daniel builds upon Moses' eschatology. Then we got into Jesus. We dealt with the appointed time, right? Deuteronomy 32, mm -hmm. 35. And the Septuagint there is that when the appointed time would come, Israel would slip. Her final judgment in her latter days would take place and she would, she would fall and that end would be near. And so we've looked at these motifs, not from myths or anything else. <laughs> the Jews and the prophets are building upon each other and revealing more and more and more. And when we got into Daniel, they just got even more clear. Yep. You know, the time of the end, the last days, is going to encompass this 490-year period. And it's going to focus in on the, the time of the Roman Empire, that fourth empire. And Daniel's very consumed with it. In Daniel chapter 7, you know, we've talked about this before. It's just not dealing with the ascension, the, the, the context before Daniel 7.13. And after the coming, you know, the coming of the Son of Man, there is when he comes as the Ancient of Days to judge, to open the books. And then there's a recapitulation there where before Jesus comes upon the clouds, the little horn is going to wage war against the saints. There we have that motif of uh, martyr vindication. It's not really spelled out as well as Isaiah does the martyr vindication theme. I think Isaiah does, um, you know, he kind of tracks on that a little bit more, but you can see it in seed form in Daniel 7 because the little horn is waging war and persecuting the saints before Christ and the kingdom come. And then we got into Jesus building upon it and we got into the appointed time, but I think there was a few more things that we, we can hit on and then we'll go into Paul. Do you want to do that? Sure. Okay, let's see what we have here. So Okay, Israel's last days, there would be this twisted and per perverse generation. Jesus in Matthew 17, 17 quotes that 
and says that his generation is the generation that Moses prophesied. So if Jesus is saying his generation is the last day's terminal generation that Moses prophesied of, Don, why do we have so many quote unquote prophecy experts telling us that our generation is the terminal generation? Uh, you know, the, I, I read a quip just today. I don't even remember where I read it. I, I was chasing some other information, trying to chase something down. And somebody was making this very point. Well, Jesus was talking about our generation. And just as an aside here, up until last week, I, I've had this one guy that has just been flooding my emails with his claims. Number one, that I'm a false teacher. I'm a heretic. I'm leading people to hell, et cetera, et cetera. But number two, that he, he has it all worked out, Mike. He's got the math worked out. I, I suppose we ought to put him in contact with Robert Price. Oh, yeah. There you go. You know, you know. But anyway, he's got it all worked out. 2025 is the year. Hmm. And <clears throat> I reminded him of <laughs> just a few of the failed prophecies who have gone before him saying they had it worked out, et cetera. Uh, well, et cetera. They, they probably didn't have the spirit, the spirit's anointing quite like he does. I'm, 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 sure he would, I'm sure he would make that argument. But the point of fact is someone responded to this kind of idea and, and said, your problem is you are reading the scriptures egocentrically. You are not reading it in light of audience relevance. You're not reading it in context. You're reading it as if the New Testament had to John Doe with your name in it. Mm -hmm. And that's precisely what happens to people. And it's, it's difficult at times to break through that egocentric barrier that people have built up. And they respond by saying, when we start saying, you have to honor audience relevance. Well, you're taking the Bible away from me. You're telling me the Bible doesn't apply to, to, to me at all. Uh, you, you know, that leads to atheism. And that leads, and you're going, whoa, slow this train down here. <laughs> you, know? you know, it's interesting watching John MacArthur deal with charismatics and saying, right. you know, you guys are reading the book of Acts as if it's all to you or yeah. for you, <laughs> right? You have to deal with the audience relevancy on the gifts. And I'm like, yeah, well, let's do that with eschatology too, uh, you know, uh, John. But, okay, so Jesus so anyway, also... That, Go ahead. That's what happens. You know, your question was, why is it that people, they, they gloss over Jesus' statement as he's talking to this crooked and perverse generation, and he goes, well, then Jesus must have been talking about our generation. Look at, look at how crooked it is today. Look at how wicked it is today. My goodness gracious. Uh, look. How many times, Mike, have we heard people say there's never been a generation as wicked as ours? There has oh, never know. been a, yeah. a there's never been a nation as wicked as ours. Yeah. And one of the very first times I heard someone say this, they were just going on and on. It was about the political corruption. It was about mm -hmm. the immorality in the movies. And it was this. No, this is this has got to be the last days because ne we've never seen a time like this. I said, well, let me ask you a question. I said, uh, have we ever had a president that publicly in front of a huge audience publicly raped a man <laughs> and then I, and then married him? Yeah. And they oh, what are you, who, what are you what are you talking about? What are you talking about? And I said, Well, I'm just asking a simple historical question. Yeah. And I said, what are you? No, of course not. We've never had anything like that. I said, well, Nero did that. Oh, you're kidding. I said, no. And that's, <laughs> that was one of the minor things that he did. <laughs> right. Yeah. So I, I, people back to the point, people get so focused on the present time of our day. And, and that's somewhat, you know, understandable. But I it's think it's just a base. I think it's narcissism that's just wired in us, as yeah. far as a, a natural, sinful create cre, uh, creature. That's just you know, without the word of God and without without the spirit of God, we're so self oriented. Yeah, uh, it just comes so natural. 
And I, I think that ultimately is the, the real problem. And then they read the scriptures in light of their pride and about the world just being all about them. I, I think that's exactly what we're talking about. And, and that's one of the functions that we in the preterist movement have got to keep emphasizing to people that your name does not appear in this Bible. This Bible is written to a particular people at a particular time. And that doesn't mean it has no relevance to us today by any stretch of the imagination, right. because the things that were to be fu fully realized, consummated and perfected in the first century are without end. Yeah. They are for all men of e every generation, but we have to determine what happened then. Exactly. All right. Uh, number two. Now, in Deuteronomy 32, 5, he connects that perverse and crooked generation with Israel's end. Mm -hmm. And in Matthew 24, that's the whole subject that goes back and forth, right? That's what the disciples are asking about. They knew, they knew Deuteronomy 32. They knew Daniel. They knew, you know, that, that the Messiah would come in vengeance in a, in a terminal generation and that Israel's end would be then. Um, so, you know, the futurists that say the disciples are confused just don't understand the Old Testament how and how the Old Testament connected all these things together like Jesus does. And he says that the end of the Old Covenant age would take place in his generation, just as Moses is prophesying. And I have said this many, many times. I'll continue to say it because I think it's one of the most critical underlying fallacies when people approach the Olivet Discourse in Jesus' eschatology, you touched on it just a moment ago. And that's how scholars and commentators say, well, you know, here's Jesus predicting the destruction of Jerusalem. And the apostles automatically think about the end of time. They automatically think about the end of the Christian age. And I, I keep going back to the statement by John Calvin that I, the very first time I ever read it in his commentary on Matthew 24, uh, two and three there, uh, John Calvin says, to paraphrase him, the apostles simply could not conceive of the idea of that temple being destroyed unless it was at the end of time. And the very, the very thing that jumped up in my mind, I go, wait a minute, why not? Did they Babylon, not know? The Babylonian captivity. That's, that's exactly what I was thinking. I was like, wait a minute, weren't they aware of the fact that the Babylonians has, had raised the temple, the Solomonic temple, in 586 BC. Oh, by the way, they only had five feast days, or excuse me, five fasts, not feast days, five fasts to commemorate that destruction. Mm. So how in the world could John Calvin, brilliant as he was in many ways, how could John Calvin say, well, you know, they just didn't get it. They had to be thinking about the end of time. Oh my. Oh my. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, now Deuteronomy 32 does talk about people not getting it. Yes. But, um, G, you know, and Daniel says at the end in Daniel chapter 12, he says that the wicked are not going to understand this, but the wise will. And, and of there's course, another I'm, passage. I'm, I'm kind of uh, jumping ahead here, but, you yeah, know, Jesus, odd. Jesus talks about, you know, you have to be born from above. You have to be given eyes to see and ears to hear, to understand and to discern what the kingdom is all about. And so we just have a remnant within Israel that's going to have the ears to hear, the eyes to see, and to have that spiritual understanding. And that only comes through the grace of God. So... Well, there's another passage that goes along with what we're talking about right here. And it's one that um, I know when you look at the commentaries, it's not mentioned very often, but it segues beautifully into what you were saying and what, what Daniel was told, you know, that in those last days, the wicked would not understand, but the wise would. And that, that goes beautifully to what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 24, verse 15 and 16. When you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel, the prophet, yeah. let the one who reads understand yes but so many people when they have their prejudices their uh their traditions they have everything in the world getting in the way that they, they they can't see it you know it's it's, it's almost like that and, and so we have these passages in which jesus was saying 
you got to open your eyes, guys. But the, the passage is Hosea chapter 13. Now, mind you, 14, 14 excuse me. Uh, this is in the context of the resurrection, Mike, as you well know. Chapter 13, 14 is the text, O grave, where is your victory? God was promising to overcome death. Obviously, it's not biological death because of verse 1 and 2. When Israel sinned, he died. Yet he sinned more and more. So this is the promise of the resurrection. And as he continues his discussion, he goes into chapter 14. And he promises, I'm going to heal Israel from their backsliding. I will love them freely for my anger has turned away from him. I will be like the dew to Israel. He shall grow up like the lily and lengthen his roots like Lebanon. His branches shall, shall spread. His beauty shall be like an olive tree and the fragrance like Lebanon. So here in, in the midst of this condemnation of Israel, Israel's death for violating Torah and, and engage in idolatry. And again, the death that would, that would ensue, we find the promise of blessing, the promise of resurrection. And here is the promise of restoration which is resurrection, of course. Right. But notice this. Verse 9, Hosea 14. Who is wise? Let him understand these things. Hmm. Who is prudent? Let him know them. For the ways of the Lord are right. Now, in the Hebrew, it's the ways of the Lord are straight. Hmm. But the righteous, or excuse me, the righteous walk in them, but transgressors stumble in them. You know, Paul, I don't know that he had this verse in mind, but when he says the natural man cannot receive the things that are of God for their foolishness to him, it, it would take discernment. Paul said, we compare spiritual things with spiritual. Well, just see, Robert Price says, no, you look, gotta look, gotta look at them literally and physically. That's exactly what Richard Carrier says as well. Mm -hmm. Richard Carrier says, well, Peter definitely expected, uh, you know, the earth and the elements, physical elements to be to be melted. Uh, Jesus expected uh, back to Paul. First uh, Thessalonians four. Paul expected the earth to be deserted because they were, all the saints are going to be caught up. Jesus expected to come, come down, swoop up all the saved and take them away. Hmm. OK, wooden literalism. Yeah, it's, it's what it, it is, what it is all about about and there is not a one-to-one -one fulfillment between the words of the text and the fulfillment this gets back to the very nature of hebraic apocalyptic language that the new testament writer you know how many times did jesus say let the one who has eyes to see let him see let the one who has ears to hear let him hear Mm -hmm. uh, as N.T. Wright points out, what Jesus was saying is, guys, um, you think you understand? You don't. It's going to take spiritual discernment to, to understand and to see what I'm talking about. It's just like Jesus said, the kingdom doesn't come with observation. Well, here are the Jews going, no, 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 no. That can't be right. Uh, we want a warrior riding on a white horse coming in to kill all the Romans. We, we want to watch it. We want to stand back and watch. And Jesus yeah. says, uh, no. <laughs> Even though Daniel said it's going to be a different kingdom and it yeah. couldn't be any clearer, <laughs> you know, in, in Daniel chapter two and Daniel 12 ends with, most of you guys aren't going to get this. Most of you guys are not going to understand. And it goes all the way back to, to Moses. You are not going to be able to discern what your end is because you're so carnally minded you're not going to see the spiritual things of the new covenant and the new covenant kingdom that messiah is going to usher in and uh, I, I think it was it <clears throat> was it jay ross wagner or richard hayes commenting on on that blindness i, I know nt Wright does extensively as i've shared uh, before but it was either jay ross wagner or or richard hayes pointed out in regard to israel's blindness which is right there in Deuteronomy, as we've been, as we have already shown, and Deuteronomy 38, 30, 40, 40, I'll get this right in a moment, 32, 28. Uh, 
Jesus said, this is a people of no understanding. Mm -hmm. And this is the history. And so, uh, again, as either Wagner or Hayes said, the Jews either would not or could not see that they were committing a sin far, far greater than the sins of their fathers, which they often castigated for their blindness. They were doing something far worse in rejecting Jesus because they refused to see what he was doing. You know, John, I believe it's John chapter eight, where Jesus said, why do you not understand my words? Well, the basic response to that was his own answer to that was you're from below. I'm from above you. You're we're on different wavelengths, guys. <laughs> yeah. And in John chapter six, he says, he says, you can't come to me unless the father draws you. Uh, John chapter three, he says, you know, you have to be born from above or you, you're not even going to come. You're not even going to see the things of the spiritual kingdom unless there's a work that's done in you. And in John chapter six, he says, the words that I say are spirit and they are life. But your guys are thinking about physical bread. Physical you know, still water. You're, you're, you're thinking about the physical miracle I did yep. and what Moses did. And you're not thinking about that I am the bread of life. And they they just missed everything. But I, let's go ahead and uh, yep. hit as many of these as we can and see if we can start getting into Paul. We had a whole show, maybe two shows, Mm -hmm. on developing uh, Matthew 23 and filling up the measure. And of course, Daniel picks this in Deuteronomy 32. I think it's, uh, I know it's uh, verses 34. Let's see here. Let me, you know, they're heaping up their sin. They're, um, they're uh, storing up sin. Yeah, there it is. Okay. 34 and 43. And then of course, Jesus says they're filling up the measure of their sin. And Daniel 9.24, they were filling up some, uh, most of your translations say that they are, um, they're going to finish the transgression. But but guys like Michael Brown and some other Old Testament scholars understand that to mean uh, that their, Israel was filling up the measure of their sin. Well, and, many, many of the early church writers took that position. I believe yeah. John Calvin did, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, oh, I, nice. know, I, I, know, I know Jerome did, uh, mm -hmm. Tertullian did. Uh, a lot of the early writers recognized that filling up uh, that to finish the transgression had to do with filling up that measure of sin. And and by the way, we we see that at different points uh, throughout Scripture. Isaiah fifty nine, which Paul uses directly in Romans chapter eleven in his prediction of the salvation of quote all Israel in Romans chapter eleven twenty six and twenty seven, he quotes verbatim. From Isaiah 59. Well, Isaiah 59 most assuredly does predict the time when God, when God, in which God said, I will take away their sin. This is my covenant with them when I take away their sin. But that's not the totality of it. Earlier in the chapter, and to me, Isaiah 59 breaks itself down beautifully. Number one, accusation. In verses 3, 5, 7, and I believe it's 12, Yahweh accuses Israel of violence and shedding innocent blood at least three times yeah. and he accuses them of injustice and cruelty etc cetera, etc cetera. <clears throat> so that's accusation number two is acknowledgement israel actually acknowledges her sin acknowledges that the accusation is accurate <clears throat> and says our sins mount up to heaven right that's filling up the measure of sin and and so this concept that back here in deuteronomy that god was measuring up there you know that sin was mounting up is a constant theme even of the last days and jesus right. is just simply picking up on it yeah, I was, I was trying to find the, our Isaiah parallels between, but you're right. Isaiah 59, <clears throat> it's more descriptive, actually, than Isaiah chapter 5 when it comes to the sin of blood guilt. I mean, Isaiah 59 is beautiful because you say, 
he's putting on his garments of war as well. And I look at Isaiah 59 and Isaiah 63. He's putting on these garments of war and he's treading down the enemies is in a wine press and he's getting their blood on his garments. Why? Because they had shed the blood of his children, his people. And so now he's filling the land with their blood because they had shed and defiled the land with the blood of the innocent. Exactly. And their blood is crying out to God. For yeah. And back to Isaiah chapter 59, that third point is God's action. He, he accused them, they acknowledged, and now he was going to take action. The very things that you were saying there a moment ago. And that is when he saw, and there was no man, there was no intercessor. Therefore he put on the garments of wrath. He put on the garments of vengeance breastplate, you know, helmet of salvation, took on the sword of vengeance. And he said, surely I will repay. I will recompense all of my enemies. He said, he said, I'm going to take away the sin of those who call on the name of the Lord. And then I'm going to bring vengeance and wrath on those, my enemies. And so you have all of these motifs. You know, I, I'm absolutely convinced that Isaiah 59 is drawing directly on the Song of Moses. Absolutely. Uh, we didn't develop it just tremendously, but I, I'm absolutely convinced that because the language, the, the linguistics are just all there. Oh, yeah. And, and again, this is where, you know, Paul in Romans chapter 11, we've already taken note of how Paul definitely draws from the Song of Moses in the blindness uh, there. <clears throat> Pardon me. And the calling of the Gentiles. I, I was called of those who did not know me, et cetera, et cetera, that Paul quotes verbatim in Romans chapter 10, 20 and following to justify his Gentile mission. But the whole point of it is here, here is Paul when he is actually quoting from Isaiah 59 about the coming salvation of Israel. As Richard Hayes points out, when you, when you acknowledge metalepsis, <coughs> metalepsis, that is, he's, he's not just throwing out cherry picking, just, one little statement about, oh, yeah, you know, uh, this is my covenant with them when I take away their sin. No, 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 no. He's bringing that whole context over. Okay. Mm. Well, if he's bringing that whole context over, guess what comes along with that day of salvation? It's the day of wrath and it's the day of vengeance. Mm -hmm. and, you, and you can't have the vindication of the martyrs without the judgment and resurrection of the dead. And I know guys like Gentry... And, and partial predators try and do that the best they can. But, uh, you know, that's why I just, listening, watching Gentry in, Re in Revelation chapter 11, try and mess around with the Greek there. And well, this really isn't the judgment of the dead. It's it's the avenging and of, of, of the martyrs. And I'm like, it's the same thing. What do you think? It's the time of the dead martyrs? that they should be judged. <laughs> what do you think? What do you think? The, what do you think the martyrs are going to be rewarded with? Yeah, no joke. And, and how many times are they rewarded? Yeah. <clears throat> it's, it's bizarre. I, I'm like you. Uh, every time I've read Gentry on Rome, uh, Revelation chapter 11, I, I wind up just shaking my head. <clears throat> and that Latin term, which is not a Latin term, <laughs> that, that I came up with, with argumentum ad desperatum, just keeps flashing up and flashing up and flashing up. He is trying to grasp at any kind of a straw at all. Yeah. to salvage his futurism. I and know. as you, as you and I have both said on many, many occasions, when he, when he acknowledges that revelation chapter 11, 15 and following is about Israel's last days, whether he sees it or not, he has surrendered his futurist eschatology. I mean, back to the excellent points that you just made, how, how do you even begin to take resurrection out of the text? It's the time of the dead that they should be judged and to reward your servants, the prophets. Yeah. Let me see. Revelation chapter 20, the books are open and the dead are judged. <laughs> right. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> and, and everyone and their grandma sees that except for a partial preterist because he just will not allow that recapitulation. And in, in uh, Revelation 27 through 15, it's. It's, it's, it's really sad, but yeah, it truly is. All right. So 
the filling up the measure, Jesus tracks on that. The terminal generation, Jesus tracks on that. The end, the end of the old covenant age, he tracks on that. And of course, Don's going to be developing that with the liberal who thinks that Jesus was predicting end of world history and is going to get crushed. Um, number four, there's covenant curses that are poured out. And Jesus is in the Olivet Discourse and elsewhere. It's all about the covenant curses. God comes in vengeance to give recompense and reward, which we were just talking about in Deuteronomy 32, 36 through 43. And Don, maybe we can camp on here just a little bit. Yeah. <clears throat> Christ comes in vengeance and fulfillment of Isaiah 61. I think it is it two. And, yeah, two yeah. you know, and here he's tracking on Deuteronomy 32 as well. Uh, I, I believe one of the great problems that we have in evangelical Christianity today is the dichotomization of motifs. Now that's kind of a fancy way of expressing something. But Thomas I said the fallacy of preterism is that they only see judgment <laughs> on Israel in AD 70. But the Bible talks about the salvation of Israel at the coming of the Lord. And the very first time I, I read that, I thought, well, that's that's an attempt to take Jehoiakim's penknife and cut between yeah. vengeance and salvation. Yeah. Prophets and, never did that. I mean, this the, and I have run into this time after time after time after time. And their argument goes something like this on Isaiah chapter 61, uh, talking about the coming of Christ. And he would proclaim the acceptable day of the Lord, acceptable year of the Lord. There you go. And the day of vengeance of our God. Well, in Luke chapter 4, when Jesus quoted, and, or I should say read from Isaiah 61, he closed the book and he did not say, he did not read the part and the day of vengeance of our God. And so our dispensational friends say, ah, see, see? <laughs> he left that out on purpose because Jesus did not come to proclaim vengeance. And that's what Thomas Ice appealed to. He said, Jesus purposely left out the part of vengeance because Jesus did not proclaim vengeance. Well, <laughs> you know, at times, Mike, I, I know you felt this way. When you read some of these comments by our dispensational friends, you, you're literally staggered that someone would make a comment like that. Jesus never talked about vengeance. Vengeance was unfortunately a great part of Jesus's message. I mean, just consider, this is just jumping forward uh, <clears throat> into the gospel of Matthew, for instance. But in Matthew 16, 27 and 28, the Son of Man will come in the glory of the Father with his angels and shall reward every man. Well, unless you're going to take the position that every man was going to get rewarded with the good, with salvation, then guess what? He's going to give vengeance to some. So you can't divide it you get, uh, it, again, if you take, well, he's going to reward every man, you say, oh, see, that's just salvation. Well, then you're teaching universalism. But you come forward, and of course, you got Matthew 17, 17, and the implication there of vengeance. Why? Because this is the perverse generation. What was going to come on the perverse generation? Ah, Deuteronomy 32, 36 and 43. Vengeance is going to come upon this perverse generation and then boy <clears throat> then it gets real harsh if you want to put it like that <clears throat> <clears throat> a certain man had a vineyard to let it out to workers the time of the harvest came he sent out his workers to gather the vintage the workers of the vineyard beat them mistreated them did the same did the same finally says i'll send my son surely they will reverence him but instead they say ah this is the son. This is the heir. Let us kill him and take the vineyard for ourselves. <clears throat> well, Jesus posed the question. Moist what will the master of that vineyard do? Mm -hmm. And this is really critical. And so many people overlook it. <clears throat> Pardon me. What will the master of the vineyard do when he comes? That's from a 
that's a cognate of the Greek word erkomai. It's the Greek word elthi. Erkomai is used in Matthew chapter 24, verse 30. They shall see the Son of Man coming. That's obviously a future tense in that text, but same basic word, erkomai. Elthi is used in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. That to you who are troubled, rest with us when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven in flaming fire, taking vengeance on those that do not know God. When he comes in that comes in that day, comes is from Elthi, i.e. Erkoma. Well, what was the master of that vineyard going to bring when he came? <clears throat> yeah, he was going to bring judgment, but he was also going to give the, the vineyard to another group. He's going to take the kingdom from them and give the kingdom to another nation, the church bearing fruit and everywhere. I don't care if we're looking at Malachi three and four and John the Baptist eschatology in Matthew three, when he comes, when the harvest comes, it, it's, it's two sides of one coin. That's exactly you have judgment right. for the apostates and you have reward and salvation for the righteous remnant. And you know, uh, Thomas Ice's big thing in Matthew 23, I think I have it up here. Matthew 23, 29 through 39. He says, well, look, judgment, judgment, judgment. Oh, but verse 39 <laughs> yeah. comes in the name of the Lord. See, see, that's salvation. So that's a future coming of Jesus, right? And, you know, as, as you've pointed out in that, that commentary that you found in that bookstore, it's like, no, that's that's still, they're, they're going to see him in judgment when they're on that wall singing, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord to the pilgrims. Eventually, they're going to look out there and see the faces of Rome. <laughs> and that's kind of what he's he's referring to. That's exactly right. That is exactly right. Well, and, and the point, of, again, is <clears throat> you cannot separate the time of judgment from the time of salvation. Mm -hmm. These are Siamese twins, theologically, linguistically. And, and even to return to Matthew chapter 22 now, a great a royal king or a king made a wedding feast for his son sent out his servants, called those who had been already invited, saying, all things are ready, come to the feast. And of course, we know, Mike, uh, you know, you, you and I just got to catch up with this. You know, all things are ready, come to the feast. Doesn't mean it was actually ready. It means that in a couple of thousand or, you know, 10,000, 15, 20,000, I don't know, a gazillion years from then, you know, the wedding will take place. So okay. anyway, I just wanted to throw that in for our correction. Oh, okay. Yeah, we're kind of like Doug Wilson, we're we're, <laughs> we're in the betrothal period, and and the uh, the New Jerusalem is just taking its time coming down, man. <laughs> that is the slowest. That is the slowest wedding procession in the history of the earth. Yeah, <laughs> it is. Yeah. So anyway, so these servants are sent. These servants are sent. These servants are sent, and they're persecuted. They're slain. The master of the wedding is angry. And he sends out his armies and they destroy those wicked men and burn their city. Listen, even Donald Hagner in the word biblical commentary on Matthew says it is impossible to read this without thinking or without seeing AD 70. Now, if a scholar such as Donald Hagner, who is not a preterist by any stretch of the imagination, but if he can so clearly see that, then maybe, maybe people, people ought to start paying attention to the reality is, that is right there. So here's the destruction of the city and the temple. But then the master says to his servants, go out into the highways and the byways and find those. Well, these are folks who had never been invited. Gentiles. These are Gentiles. These are the pagans and compel them to come in. So after, you have. After Acts, Act, after Acts 7. We're bringing in the Gentiles. That's exactly right. Uh, which, I mean, that basically destroys this crazy Israel only doctrine. I mean, if, if you, all you, all you have to do is ask the question, who was it that was going to be invited to the wedding? It was the 10 Northern tribes and Judah. Yeah. In other words, the whole, whole house of Israel. Well, they rejected the offer. So the offer gets sent out to those who had never been invited, never been invited. And they get to come to the wedding. Bingo. So, yeah, there's no way there's no way to make that anything but the Gentiles in the purest sense of the word Gentile. Amen. 
And of course, number six, the appointed time. And that's a, you know, a show that Don and I did a couple of weeks ago. We spent a lot of time in the Olivet Discourse and throughout the Gospels going over the appointed time had come. And uh, in Luke 21, Mark 13, Matthew 24, <clears throat> the, <clears throat> he refers to the appointed time very close to the day and hour. He refers to the appointed time in the sense that don't listen to the false teachers when they say that the appointed time is near because he says, no, the gospel has to be preached in all the world as a sign first. And it is implied then the appointed time would be near. And of course, Paul will pick up on that um, here in a bit. And then, of course, number six, Jesus prophesied. Well, we already talked about that, the appointed time. And I think that's pretty much, um, oh, the nation, right? Uh, in Deuteronomy 32, number eight, he talks about he's going to make Israel jealous by forming another nation. And then right after that, he talks about the decreation of Old Covenant Israel. And then you can track that in Isaiah 65 and 66 when he's judging Old Covenant Israel. That heaven and earth is passing away, but he's creating a new nation, a new Jerusalem. And so Jesus is tracking on that going to uh, Matthew 21 and 22. He's going to take the kingdom from them and give it to another nation. And that's the nation that is now going to make Israel jealous, which will form kind of Paul's argument in Romans 9 through 11. And, you know, the decreation. Go ahead. Something I pointed out a few moments ago, and this is, to me, this is so incredibly, uh, profoundly important. They're in Romans chapter 10 and chapter 11. Paul quotes verbatim from Isaiah 65, 1 and 2. And Deuteronomy, yeah. And, and Deuteronomy 32. Mm -hmm. So you have Deuteronomy 32 that talks about uh, Israel had made Yahweh jealous through idol, through idolatry. So the Lord says, verse 21, 20 and 21, I will turn them to jealousy by another people. I'm going to call a people to me that I've never known, that has never called on my name and turn them to jealousy. And so here in the New Testament, in the Pauline literature, as Paul is talking about his ministry to the Gentiles saying, guess what? And again, he quotes verbatim from Isaiah 65, 1 and 2, and Romans 10, 20 and 21. And he applies it to his ministry and to the calling of the Gentiles. To yeah. return to, to that little magical word, metalepsis, that means that Paul is applying Isaiah 65 to his generation. And, and uh, boy, yeah. I've, I've said this so very often. I think it's difficult, Mike, for us today, since we are not... We're, as much as we try, as much as you and I both study, we are not as saturated with every idiom, with every thought, with every text of the Tanakh. We're just not. Right. I work on it. You work on it. <clears throat> but to the ancient Hebrews, listen, by the time <clears throat> when they were getting ready to have their bar mitzvah at age 13, a boy, a young boy, had to be able to quote verbatim Genesis through Deuteronomy. Hello. <laughs> yeah. uh, but that gives you an idea of how, how saturated they were. There, there are lots and lots of stories of rabbis who could quote the entirety of the Old Testament. Every single book, every single chapter every single verse. Mm -hmm. And, it's you know, great. writing was very expensive back then. Oh, it was. And yeah. so, so not only do they have all this scripture memorized, but writing was very expensive. So it's, it, it's only natural that in their hermeneutic and, and how it would develop is they would appeal to a certain passage, but they understood the block, like say it was Isaiah's little apocalypse, yeah. right? A block of, a, scripture very well known they would incorporate that whole eschatology that old the all that theology that entire context and you know we talked about this before you know michael brown <laughs> poo pooed your approach to all the old testament texts that paul's appealing to in romans 9 through 11 and yet then he whines 
when Rabbi Tovia Singer is appealing to Psalm 22 and some of these other passages and, and claiming that the New Testament authors aren't incorporating more. And, and, and Michael Brown says, oh, no, it was a Jewish <laughs> hermeneutic that they would incorporate the whole context. You yeah. can't have it both ways there, dude. That's exactly right. So, again, that point being, since Paul is quoting the, the psalm and quoting the Isaiah, uh, and I like what Ross Wagner says on this, Paul in Romans 9 to 11 is calling Moses and Isaiah as his chief witnesses to indict Israel of his day for their unbelief, which would, in, which would lead invariably to their destruction. That's the message of Moses. That's the message of Isaiah. You, yeah. you, can, you cannot ignore the fact that Moses is predicting Israel's last days. Isaiah is predicting Israel's last days and the new creation. They are interconnected. They are hand in glove. And, and so yeah. to, to, try to, to try to say, well, yeah, Paul quoted from Isaiah 65, 66. But that doesn't mean that he has the context of Isaiah 65, 66 and the new creation in mind in, I, in Romans chapter 11. No, it means precisely that. Yeah, yeah. And it, it, it's beautiful, the harmony there in Deuteronomy 32 with the formation of the Gentile nation or the church right on the heels of the decreation of oh, old yeah. covenant Israel. And then you come into to Romans or, and you go into Isaiah and it's the same. And then Paul appeals to both. And it's, it's like, Hey guys, how can you say that, that the mission has failed to Israel when this was prophesied in Deuteronomy and Isaiah? That, I mean, in a nutshell, that's basically what he's saying. Oh, he's that's destroying precisely. them with their own scriptures. Yeah, and that, that's why, as I just noted, J. Ross Wagner says, Paul is call, calling Moses and Isaiah, you know, here's the lawgiver and the prophets. He's calling the law and the prophets as his chief witness in his indictment of Israel. And that blindness that Isaiah talks about repeatedly over and over and over all throughout the book of Isaiah, Isaiah chapter six, Isaiah 28, Isaiah chapter 29. And I like what N.T. Wright says about this. N.T. Wright says when Paul says blindness in, heart, uh, in part has happened unto Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And N.T. Wright says one would really like to think, well, okay, then until the fullness of the Gentiles comes in, that might, uh, <clears throat> that might indicate a reversal of Israel's fortune. But he said, however, when one follows the, the imagery of Israel's blindness, Israel's blindness in the Tanakh invariably led to their judgment, not to their salvation as a nation, but to the destruction and ju judgment of the nation leading to the salvation of a remnant. Mm -hmm. And I, he, I mean, he's exactly right on that. When you... <clears throat> when you follow that lit, that line of discussion of blindness of Israel in the Tanakh, invariably it was God would talk about their blindness and say, okay, here's what's coming, guys, as a result of your blindness. Very soon. And very soon. And so thus again, <clears throat> in Romans chapter 11, 25 when Paul and he's already brought out their blindness earlier mm -hmm. in the chapter and one of the most powerful passages that he is, has adduced is is from Psalms chapter 69 which is just I mean good grief it is an incredible text that is and, and many 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 commentators have just glossed right over but I'm telling you the messianic import the last days import of the coming destruction of Israel because of their blindness is incredible. I mean, <clears throat> it's extremely powerful. I would encourage everyone to read Psalm 69 as Paul quotes it. Let their table become a snare unto them. Mm -hmm. Lord, they've closed their eyes. Well and and their really? Passover and their Passover table had become a snare in AD 66. <laughs> That's pre precisely what happened. It's precisely what happened. They were gathered to observe the feast days, to gather around their table, 
and they were entrapped within the city. Amen. Yeah. Amen. All right. Well, I um, hope you guys enjoyed this episode. I think next week we will deal a little bit more with Paul's eschatology in Deuteronomy 32. And then maybe, I don't know, do you want to go to Peter next or Why not? John? Or? Yeah, sure. Why not? Okay. And we'll do that. And uh, I'm excited about this. When's the debate again, Don? October the 12th. That's okay. on a Saturday. Uh, okay. I, I will actually be in Asheville, North Carolina. For yeah. One of I'll have to, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try and drive down there. Excellent. Uh, but I'll be there for a Burroughs of Berea blog, mm -hmm. and then we're staying over for Saturday. <clears throat> Pardon me. And they've already told me, they said that we're going to set up a studio for you, going to have a beautiful background, and you're going to look good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I was talking to Rick about it the other day. He's, yeah. he's, yeah, when he puts something on, I mean, he goes, he goes all out. So, well, I'm, I'm uh, boy, I can't tell you how excited I am about this. It's, it's not often that you can get some of the higher academic guys to actually stoop to debate somebody like us. You know? and, yeah. and so, uh, so I give Dr. Carrier credit on in that way. And it's just a matter of trying to get the point across. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, we'll catch you next Friday then. All right, man. Good night. Take care. Before my God In the light In the light In the light of life In the light of life In the light of life in the light of life, in the light of life, in the light of life.